Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. We're gonna get started in just one minute. We're still letting some people in in the waiting room. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Shawnee Ades. Um, we're so excited to have so many of you with us again um, or joining us for the first time for our Trauma Responsive Lawyering Training Series. This is the second series in our training on the neurobiology of trauma. Um, and we're really grateful that you have taken the time to join us in this space where mental health experts, lawyers, paralegals, advocates, and activists are all coming together so that we can better understand trauma um, and therefore better um, understand how to serve trauma survivors as we engage in this work. I'm going to turn this over to Integra Feliciano to go over some administrative details before we begin. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. My name is Integra Feliciano. So just a couple of webinar logistics. The session will be recorded. The chat feature today will be moderated by Shami Ades. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please send it in the chat and it'll be directed to the host or co-host. You are automatically muted upon entering. Please mute yourself throughout the entire seminar unless stated otherwise. If you're joining us today on the phone, please use star six to mute yourself. At the end of the session, you will be invited to fill out an evaluation. Please complete this as soon as possible. Um, if you wish to obtain CLE credit, you will also receive a second evaluation to fill out and relevant course material will be in the Google Drive. Just another reminder, um, the Zoom link is the same for all sessions. If you are obtaining CLE credits, please see the registration link for information on CLE credits. An email with further information will be sent to you after this training. To get CLE credit, you must attend the entire training session um, and respond to both polls confirming your attendance during the session. For more information, please contact sades at nyleg.org. All right, so our presenter today is um, Dr. De Denise Hyen. Um, her presentation is on neuroscience of trauma. She is the interim dean of the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology, director and Helen E. Cheney Endowed Chair in Alcohol Studies at the Center of Alcohol and Substance Use Studies at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She and her group have conducted programmatic research on women's mental health and addictions with continuous funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse and National Institute on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse for over 20 years. Considered a leader in her field, her body of work, she has over 100 publications and 140 um, conference presentations. She has contributed to the evidence base on the treatment of individuals with trauma-related psychiatric disorders and their comorbidity with addictions. She is board certified in clinical psychology and has served as a standing member on the National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIH Institutional Review Groups, and the Health Disparities Advisory, Advisory Group for the NIH. NIDA Director of Asian American Pacific Islander Issues. Thank you, Integra, for that um, nice introduction. And um, I just want to say how pleased I am to be here and uh, appreciative of um, uh, Dr. Fiddleson and uh, 
OB um, for for uh, the the putting together such an important um, you know series of seminars and trainings for all of you and um, before I even get started also want to just applaud all of you for the work that you do in helping our um, populations in the various ways that um, are needed and so I'm a clinical psychologist um, by training and have spent the better part of my career working in um, communities of the upper upper Manhattan, Harlem, um, Washington Heights area, doing research to kind of understand the landscape of traumatic stress and um, its associated sort of mental health and substance use issues in um, our community and families. And as a consequence of that have, um, have you know, sort of needed to learn more about the neuroscience of how trauma impacts the brain and the body and so i think i was asked to you know you know give this talk um not so i mean i'm obviously i'm not a neuroscientist but really um as part of my work on helping to understand trauma and its consequences uh you know, have needed to and, and do regularly present on incorporating our understanding of what happens to the brain and body um, to help us better, um, you know, sort of recognize some of the issues that our patients and clients face and then also to address and obviously intervene. Um, and so what I'm going to be sharing with you guys uh, today over the course of the next couple of hours is um, to focus on some of the um, history and, and epidemiology and numbers and terms that I think are gonna be relevant in helping us to understand uh, more about the um, impacts of trauma on the body and the brain, and then to actually talk about some of the key um, sort of takeaway points. So I don't expect to be um, hopefully talking at the level of neurotransmitters and you know so much of the science language, but trying to help interpret the science language um, in ways that have been helpful to me in my work and also in the trainings and um, teaching that I do of clinical psychologists. Um, we are going to talk about some of the associated complications of trauma related injuries that include an area of specialty for me, which is um, addressing and thinking about how to sort out substance use and other mental health related issues that um, face our you know, clients that have been you know, victims of domestic violence and exposed to all kinds of other types of lifetime trauma. And um, I will end with an overview on uh, you know, the treatment models, not so much getting into all the specific details of every type of model, but giving you some broad ideas about what we do know and what is the evidence base that we have for how we can intervene and then also directing you to some um, resources. And so throughout the talk, um, what I'm going to be doing is um, we're going to have breaks in, you know, embedded into the, this talk so that we can have discussion. And I encourage people to be, um, you know, feel free to ask whatever questions you have. And Shani is going to be the chat checker and will sort of field some of the questions and then we'll also um shani as the as as a lawyer will also um be involved in helping me to present a case that um we can use to think about some of the things that we're going to talk about today but as well we're hoping that um those of you in the audience who feel like it could also bring up specific questions and case material and um, so I want to you know even though I do have slides to talk through want to make this an engaging session and not be just throwing information at you um, and at about the 50 you know about an hour mark um, we will also do a little you know stretch and breathing 
um, exercise to uh, to sort of break up the um, the time. So with that, I'm going to start with um, talking a bit about sort of my perspective on the work that has been done up to date with regard that affect um, you know our thinking about battered uh, you know domestic violence um, over the course of time. And I sort of start this in the 1970s when we think about that, which now is you know, um, I mean, I, I was born in the 60s, so the 70s, you know, was when I was, you know, kind of a teenager. Um, but um, during that time, looking back, we've got, you know, the, the, um, the first beginnings of really addressing domestic violence for women with the women's civil rights movement and the women's movement kind of driving this um, new found kind of advocacy for focusing on women and um, women's experiences and specifically around um, you know domestic violence this is outside of the domain of psychiatry and medicine it's really at the at this point uh, very much of a grassroots advocacy movement and um, then we have the mid 80s when we think about you know the beginnings of the you know crack cocaine and violence escalation in this country related to violence we also have mass incarceration that starts to be impacting our black and brown communities and families um, related to um, the crack cocaine epidemic and um, it isn't until the late 80s, which now might seem like a long time ago, but it's actually not that long ago that um, the dsm 3 r changed the diagnostic criteria to allow us to start thinking about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder relevant to individuals who've experienced um, you know, partner violence, sexual abuse, childhood abuse, and things like that. Prior to the late 1980s, we didn't think about PTSD in, in relation to domestic violence because it wasn't even a criteria that we were allowed to use to um, even start thinking about the symptoms, which I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. Um, you know, during the um, the, the DSM three, you know, and prior versions of the DSM, PTSD was really a combat related disorder. It was a disaster related disorder, and interpersonal violence didn't find its way in. So we didn't even start diagnosing um, post traumatic stress disorder for anybody who'd suffered domestic violence until um, until then. Um, and then in the 90s, we have sort of like what I would say is kind of the real surge and in increase around the, uh, you know, our understanding of trauma and traumatic stress and how it um, uh, needed to be sort of filtered in. And I think more and more in, in, in really in the mid, mid to late 80s and 90s was when psychiatry and psychology started to get more involved, you know, sort of with the changes in the diagnostic system. And actually Mindy Fully Love, who is at Columbia in, in Upper Manhattan working at the Audubon Clinic, was one of the first to do what we know to be like a snowball sample where she talked to women in the community, you know, in um, Washington Heights, finding that there was this, you know, very strong association between um, substance use, crack cocaine use, and, um, and trauma and, and post-traumatic stress where like 90% of her sample were, were meeting criteria for having traumatic um, experiences, domestic violence, childhood abuse, and also meeting PTSD criteria. But Judith Herman's book, and I'll talk a little bit later about treatment, but like provides a model for thinking about how do we um, intervene around trauma and um, recovery. And uh, you know that was very important. The science that I'm also going to be talking about in terms of a lot of the neuroscience is being conducted around this time in the early 2000s. Um, I have here this picture of the twins, but um, Ken Kendler's 
um, very large scale twin study starts showing us that there are very strong associations between traumatic stress and negative outcomes um, for, for twins, which sort of establishes more of some of the causal ideas. We have some treatment manuals um, that are being developed, and I'll talk more about some of these models later. Um, and then towards the later 2000s, so now, you know, 20 years ago, we start thinking about the concepts of complex trauma, and that's also something that I'm going to to lay out for us a little bit, um, more, you know, later in in the talk. Um, and we also recognize that substance use um, becomes is a really significant problem for populations of individuals who have both um, traumatic stress exposure, domestic violence, and also substance use um, complicating the picture. And finally, up from now up until today, we have the colliding epidemics of the coronavirus, racial pandemic, and the opioid crisis that um, really um, are now at the level of these converging epidemics, which I'm talking about, I, I think of as a, a syndemic, a larger um, problem that at its core has trauma and traumatic stress as, a, as a, an important component to our understanding. So um, I know that you're all working with the most complicated and difficult cases. Um, that you you know that ended up presenting with severe you know life and death kinds of issues and also um, in the criminal justice system having to navigate for both the survivors uh, also the intergenerational issues that we see in families and child custody so there's a lot of um, pieces that all of you are wrestling with and so i'm hoping that some of this talk will provide so, and some organizing uh, frameworks for you. So to start out, and I know you heard from um, uh, the, the, the talk last week that, um, uh, you know, about a framework for thinking about traumatic stress, but um, did want to say that there's a lot of different ways we think about people um, and their exposure to trauma. We're aware that traumatic stress is, is a global health issue and that worldwide through, you know, war and famine and all the things that um, we know about coronavirus, um, that people, uh, you know, trauma is a, is a world health issue, not just a United States issue and problem. Um, but here uh, we think about domains of domestic violence um, that and so a lot of different terms we could use to apply um, that include thinking about different types of interpersonal trauma that could include emotional, physical, and or sexual types. Um, and uh, we think about domestic and community violence. I know Kate Walsh will also be talking about this to you next in the next seminar series. Um, as I sort of talked about a little bit before, we other traumatic events can be disasters. Um, you know, obviously we know a lot about what's going on now with, um, you know, hurricanes, um, horrible fires and, um, you know, flooding and things like that, that can really lead people to also um, be exposed to trauma as well as combat terrorism, um, and things like motor vehicle accidents. One of the things I like to say is that um, even though we know that um, just generally post-traumatic stress disorder can be one of the outcomes of trauma exposure, it's certainly not the only outcome, but I will be using it as a way of framing some of the neurobiology that we know um, because there has been a lot of science that has told us um, important, you know, given us important insights into understanding, you know, sort of like trauma related uh, mental health conditions. And so PTSD is definitely one of the outcomes. Um, and we'll talk about some of the others. But um, so nationally, you know, when you're exposed to a traumatic event, we know that um, women tend to develop PTSD more 
at a twice the rate of men, even though men are actually exposed to more lifetime traumatic events than women. Um, so that's just, um, you know, but, but so th that's a pretty sizable amount of people who after trauma exposure will develop, um, you know, a diagnosable disorder. Although we also, you know, do want to recognize the resilience that we see and that we see every day with the clients and survivors that we work with. So even if they are struggling with uh, mental health impacts, they also, many people may not present uh, with uh, PTSD symptoms or they may not present immediately. And then there can be a later onset, uh, you know, that goes beyond like the first month after um, exposure and again I know that what we're talking about with um, individuals that many individuals that you may be working with is um, more chronic trauma exposure not just one incident but a lifetime of potentially childhood and then you know ensuing um, later exposure um, of, of different kinds um, and this is just to show that um, for those who have diagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder, having substance use disorder and meeting criteria for other mental health conditions, most commonly, um, you know, depression, major depression or other anxiety disorders is really more the norm than the exception. So on average, more, you know, if you've been if you've been diagnosed with a lifetime post-traumatic stress disorder, you are likely to meet, more likely to meet, um, you know, over uh, three other diagnoses. And so, and, and it's very typical for women that we work with who have post-traumatic stress disorder, if you ask them or they have them um, evaluated for major depression, which is very significant, or anxiety, it's almost 80% that will also meet criteria. So part of that sort of suggests that maybe there's other ways of thinking about somebody who ha who meets multiple diagnostic criteria and we'll talk more about that um, later the concept of complex trauma but the point is that we're dealing with um, real complexity in what um, individuals are you know sort of struggling with post um, you know the kinds of trauma histories that you're you know you're that are presenting to you so, so here's you know po post traumatic stress disorder and um this is from the the DSM5 um we have you know intrusion symptoms i'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this but i do think it's important for us to sort of parse out what's happening in the brain and body and to really be able to talk about some of the details of of what you might see with PTSD and also I like to spend, um, you know, I feel like it's good for you to also have this language or, th or framework um, for thinking about some of the um, biological impacts because it, it's helpful in using it to talk to your clients or at least to understand some of the different and maybe disparate experiences that your clients are having. Um, so intrusion symptoms, what does that mean? That's like the hallmark for PTSD of nightmares, re-experiencing, having, you know, the past um, popping back into the mind at all, you know, times. So the person has difficulty um, forgetting what happened to them. And, and that's kind of like a hallmark of what we think of as PTSD is being haunted by your experiences of trauma. Um, on the other hand, there are avoidance symptoms, which, um, you know, which lead us to uh, thinking about, um, you know, of the patient's sort of shrunken life where they stay away from things that remind them of a traumatic experience. So for example, 
um, stopping leaving the house because you're afraid that something bad is going to happen to you or the reverse never going home if you're if the home is a place that reminds you of um, being abused or you know avoiding seeing friends and family um, so there's a lot of different ways that our patients and clients avoid things that bring back memories of the trauma so um, you know it's sort of a disparate um, paradoxical experience uh, set of symptoms that on the one hand you can't stop thinking about the trauma or the trauma keeps coming to mind in ways where you're trying to push it away and you are actively pushing away people and places that remind you. And so um, it, that can be very confusing for others to understand and also for the client themselves to make sense of. And they may not think of that as part of a post-traumatic response. Um, another set of uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress involve cognition and the way that people think about themselves and what happened to them. And so oftentimes people are self-blaming and um, feel very ashamed of what happened and don't see, don't necessarily allocate what happened to them in the right places. So they might really be tending to be very guilty. Um, and this is where like for people that have been part of, you know, military trauma, oftentimes you know have the the feeling of moral um you know there's a, a moral component of what they've been um doing and so uh you know these types of um symptoms are also a part of post-traumatic stress and then finally um the physical component of of changes in your actual arousal system that lead a person to potentially be very jittery and agitated, very easily startled, and very vigilant uh, and fearful, kind of looking around, always expecting um, something bad to happen and sort of looking over their shoulder, but can often present um, as irritability, paranoia, um, and, and aggressiveness, like very vigilant. For men particularly, we see, you know, reactivity and um, that can lead to, you know, confrontational and aggressive behavior um, in PTSD. And for women, um, oftentimes, you know, very easily startled. And that is also difficulty kind of settling yourself down. So all of these um, are, are components of post-traumatic stress. And um, what I want to show is um, kind of like the stress, I'm just going to, the stress response um, of, you know, this, this sort of refers to, uh, you know, the idea that we're all, we all have programming in our bodies to handle, you know, as, as part of a survival mechanism. And uh, many of you may have, um, you know, read, and if you haven't, it might be worthwhile, um, Waking the Tiger by Peter Levine, who talks about a, a kind of basic instinct that we have for survival. And when we're in a stressful situation, um, we may, uh, you know, our bodies are primed to help us manage the stress. And so um, for many of us, it might be getting an A minus in a class, not so much, um, you know, seeing a shark, you know, jumping out of the, the, the ocean, but, it, you know, and, and obviously now we're dealing with um, many of us managing stress at, uh, you know, this level um, from uh, the various, you know, the political climate we've been living through, the, um, you know, ep COVID epidemic, um, health, dis you know, disparities in our communities, like life has been more stressful than ever. Um, and so we, we can all understand that. Um, our body has, uh, you know, a, a, a response that helps us to um, organize and our body to, um, you know, respond very quickly. So if we are being chased, like by a tiger or some, something in the a wild, what do we need to do? 
um, we need to be able to have some sort of um, re response for our own survival. So um, what would that response be? Um, you know, in this animal that we see here, we, we see the fight response. And so, but there are actually three different responses that would help us manage, um, you know, a predator coming at us in the wild that, you know, that that's how our body is tuned up. And the sympathetic nervous system is the part of our body that leads, that first helps us manage. Um, and so what happens is our heart starts beating faster. So maybe we could run a a little bit faster um, and we go into sort of a more automatic response mode um, and uh, you know so we might either fight um, we might run so it's either turn and fight we're gonna um, run or we might freeze like the idea of you know curling up in a ball and maybe that's the the, the best way you can survive is by not moving um, and, and hoping that the predator will, you know, turn a different way and not see you. Um, so the, why am I telling you this? These, these are um, because it's, it's very much the case that a, a lot of our clients um, will have been um, in, you know, you know, very stressful situations and um, will have it done one of those three. And oftentimes what we deal with with our clients is not the fight or the flight, but rather the freeze. And so I'm gonna talk a little later about the idea of um, dissociation, um, but that's a very complicated issue for a lot of our clients who, again, because of the PTSD, you know, we um, are, are feel very guilty and ashamed and often say, well, if I really, why, it's my fault because I should have gotten up and left. Um, and so one of the things that's, that can be really helpful is to use kind of our knowledge of the fact that there is this stress response, that this is how we are programmed, is to react to a stressor in one of these three three ways. And so freezing is a biologically programmed potential response to, um, to a threat. The other um, thing that is also important um, to understand is that during this, this uh, stress response, um, the immune system is dampened um, because you know, that's not a system that we need to have maximized during a stressful situation where you're sort of like running away from a predator. Um, you don't need your, to, your immune system to be up and running. And what we see with a lot of our clients who have been chronically stressed is that there is a dampened immune response. And so it's not a coincidence that um, many of our clients may have autoimmune conditions um, that, uh, you know, that, that may manifest and that may, we, we may have to be dealing with. So that's just a sideline thing that I, I like for people to be thinking about and aware of because that, um, those kinds of health issues can, and I'm not talking so much about health, um, uh, you know, in this talk, but it, it is something that I think is important and many of our clients, you know, incidentally, you know, do not for various reasons, you know, go to the doctor as often, whether it's because they don't have access to uh, medical care, but even if they did have access, there may be um, time, you know, they may be avoidant of um, going for, for a whole variety of um, triggering reasons. And so it's very important for us to also be thinking about medical care even, you know, with, with the clients that we see. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, the, you know, what we do know uh, about the impacts of traumatic stress on the body um, and what I think is most useful um, for us to understand is that there's been, you know, a good, you know, using the stress model uh, that I just we just talked a bit about. Um, there's been a lot of science 
that has been done on in a, in a variety of different domains and i'm just summarizing it here in a way that is sort of that i've been able to use and and um as as a takeaway as a clinician um for thinking about you know how to how to talk about trauma um and and its impact but um because you know we we what we learn and you know how how do we learn about how have we learned about the stress response has been um because we have the ability to study um animals and so a lot of times if we can model things scientifically using either a mouse model or a rat model um and then we can study you know the endocrine system or we can study um different um, neurochemicals or we can you know sacrifice the animal and then look at changes in the brain we can learn a lot and and we have learned a lot so the stress model is a model that we have been able to use um, with animals and therefore we there, there's a lot of findings that we have and that we can also correlate in in terms of our um, understanding about uh, humans and so in this case, we know um, from both animal models and also from you know, studies with humans that there are actual changes in the brain that um, affect the regions of the brain that are you know, on an anatomical level that are involved with memory and emotion. So, um, we know that the memory region, which is the hippocampus, is one of the um, components of our limbic system, which is our emotional regulation system, um, are changed as a result of trauma exposure and chronic trauma exposure. So um, we, we you know, know from animals that the hippocampus of animals who have been exposed to chronic stress in you know lab based models um, you know are smaller and have you know more cell death and the hippocampus is the region of the brain that helps us with learning and memory so when we think about ptsd and we think of like that you know as we talked just talked about the idea of the person um, can't stop thinking about the traumatic events that happened and they keep popping into their mind and they keep being very distressed about them um, even though maybe they're out of the trauma situation now in 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 domestic violence there's you know you could have individuals who are in shelters and away from the traumatic situation or they're relocated and away from their uh, abusive partner um, but they also could be still living in situations where they would be um, traumatized you know again but for a lot of people families who you know have members of the family who or even providers who are like working with someone who seems to be very dysregulated and have those you know um, you you wonder like how come that person can't maybe it's not as mean as like why can't you just get over it but family members often feel and do not you know at a certain point they get tired of the fact that the person is constantly kind of activated and fearful and why haven't they learned that okay they have you know they were in a fearful situation but now they're you know they're safe and so they should you know their symptoms should go away and they shouldn't be so frightened well one of the explanations for that is that there's something has changed in their learning system and so maybe they're like they, they've learned that they have to be fearful at all times and they have to be vigilant at all times and it's not so easy for that that to be unlearned and maybe that has something to do with um, these neuroanatomical changes that we know to be you know happening in in people who've been exposed to in animals who've been highly stressed chronically stressed and also in in people who have been um, similarly there are a lot of um, neurochemical findings that 
um, map onto that avoidance that we talked about, the kind of shrunken life, the, the depressive symptoms, the dampening of emotion, um, the numbing of affect, the feeling that you know you don't have a future, so there's no point in planning because you just are convinced that you have no sense of the future. And so we know that there are a whole host of chemicals involved in that response. And that suggests that for some of our clients, um, maybe medications like those antidepressant medications, um, which I will also talk about a bit later, um, might be necessary to really help them to manage um, some of the symptoms that they struggle with and that even if they're out of the unsafe situation, um, they, their body may have, you know, again, been organized around um, the stress response and they, the numbing and depression that comes from that may need an actual medication to help manage some of those um, symptoms. And then finally, um, in the realm of what we were talking about, that hyperarousal in the PTSD, those uh, symptoms of exaggerated startle response or being very, very jittery or irritable or, or um, you know, that we see that there are the chemicals involved in the, what's known as the HPA, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, that stress response, the cascade of um, responses that happens on a chemical level to get our sympathetic nervous system to act quickly so that we can manage, um, you know, the predator coming at us. Those things that happen in our body may change our body. And so again, like similar to what I just said, the idea of the immuno, you know, depressed immune system um, and also that dysregulation. So we see our clients may be very moody and may not settle down easily. And we, we, we talk about that as emotional dysregulation, but that has a physical underpinning that we need to sort of be aware of and empathic to, and um, also think about ways. And there are certain medications also that can help um, clients, you know, and I'm not trying, I, I certainly don't want to be pathologizing our clients. And so it's a fine line of both recognizing that there are actual physical impacts of trauma that we can see in these various domains and we can map to symptoms of PTSD on the one hand. And on the other hand, I don't want, um, you know, I, I don't also want to be conveying that our clients are damaged goods and that it's all in them. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe we can talk about that um, in a moment. Um, I'm getting to a summary in, in two slides, but, um, you know, in terms of um, some of the other ways that we see, uh, we see impacts of uh, chronic trauma, um, the limbic system is a part, so the amygdala is part of our fear network and helps us manage fear. And um, so our, the fear system of our brain when we are exposed to you know, uh, a traumatic situation can become somewhat hyperactive and again, gets us to you know, that feeling of feeling fear um, you know, a, a, a lot of the time and um, vigilance. And so we, um, you know, similarly, or, you know, in a, another region of our brain, which is less of a, you know, so fear is more of an, uh, and the limbic system kind of gets at some automatic responses. Um, the, another part um, that we'll talk a little bit more about um, in relation to specific cognitive problems is the um, part of part of our brain that we use to make decisions about things and to manage um, you know planning and cognition um, is part of our our frontal cortex and that's an area that um, has been shown to have um, impacts of trauma and also are involved in um, so it's 
you know, both in our thinking regions and in our feeling regions, there are definitely um, impacts of, um, of traumatic stress. And so in summary um, of this section, we, the, you know, the takeaways are that stressors that activate our sympathetic nervous system and our um, so, sort of automatic arousal system um, can be um, impacted not only in the moment of being in a domestic violence um, uh, incident, but also more chronically. So even when the domestic violence isn't occurring, the person may be in a heightened state of arousal um, that leads them to being more fearful, um, more vigilant, and that we need to sort of understand that. Um, when somebody's been exposed to more than one stressor and it happens over a chronic and long-term um, you know, in a, in a chronic and long-term way, there can be changes in the neuroendocrine system and also, um, you know, dampening of the immune system that we um, can see in an ongoing way and may need to intervene either with mental health care or also with medications potentially. And finally, um, I do want to underscore that we you know, there are individual differences in genetics and experiences that predispose someone to either have a greater stress response or not. So it sort of will be dependent on each client and each situation. And again, just want to underscore that um, in many, many cases, we see um, individuals that may have these impacts, but that are also incredibly resilient and are incredibly able to continue if, you know, you know, they have children to do the work that they need to do for their children and their families. But it's our job to also recognize that there can be um, issues that they're being impacted by that are not just psychological, but also physical and need to incorporate that into our, um, our planning. So this is a point where I wanted to take a pause and, um, you know, uh, you know, have uh, Shani kind of help us engage with, um, you know, sort of some thinking about um, this. So, you know, here's, you know, a couple of questions. Have you had um, issues related to PTSD come up in a case where it impacted your ability to gauge and uh, work with a client? And also, are there other issues, uh, you know, related to some of the physical stuff that I've been talking about? that might have come up in relation to um, how a survivor might have been testifying in a court case or an assessment or any other kind of outcome. So I'm gonna give everybody a minute to please type into the chat and read back responses. And while we're waiting for those responses, I am gonna launch the first poll. So anybody who is here for CLE credit, we're gonna leave this up for one minute. Um, please respond. Um, yes or no to the question on your screen. There's simply one response you have to give. There's nothing further, so it should close out as soon as you mark it. Um, and we'll leave this up for a moment. Uh, please do um, feel free to write into the chat um, any answers to the question that's come before or any answers to the questions that are currently on your screen, and then we'll engage in some discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have about 80% of people that have voted. So I'm going to leave the poll up, but I'm going to start to read back perhaps some of the things that come up that have come up in the chat so we can start to respond as we finish and end up with the poll. 
Um, so we've had a couple of people that mentioned that, you know, they've had clients that when they're working with them, they're able to recount and tell their story, practice their testimony perfectly. But when they are in court or having to speak in front of the person that did them harm, they freeze. Sometimes they're incredibly combative. They've seen impacts in custody cases of ways that this is used against them in terms of their ability to parent. Um, sometimes people that um, both survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault who have wanted to recant, um, even though what they've said is true and has in fact happened, um, but want to take it back. Um, there are some people that are, that are talking about a few things that you've mentioned, that they've seen improvements with people that were engaging with services, that in the outset when they were working with them, they were perhaps more hysterical, more combative, unable to get through things without crying. But once they started treatment, and in fact, even antidepressants medication, that that's been um, really, really helpful. Um, and some people talking about how difficult client engagement can be um, when people are being combative um, towards us, um, disassociating um, and trying to use looping and other methods. We've had a lot of people write in. So um, thank you all for, uh, for writing in so much, but, but a lot of people seem to be seeing these fight flights and freezes and it seems to be coming out both in the attorney client engagement as well as how they present with the court and whether they choose to continue with the system. Yeah, so the question is like, how do you handle and manage that? And we're gonna talk a little bit more in, in a bit about dissociation and kind of how that manifests itself. But um, I do think that first of all, having the kind of like all of the comments that I heard back were really, you know, really getting in on that point of, those are dimensions of the post-traumatic stress response that we can fully understand from this perspective, um, you know, from that fight, flight, and freeze perspective, um, and that um, somehow knowing that may um, enable us to, first of all, it, it may be helpful to um, go, you know, cover some of that with the client themselves or, you know, and you don't have to be a mental health or many of you are mental health practitioners, but um, you may be able to refer the person or have a consultation where you're meeting, uh, you know, if you're an attorney and you don't feel comfortable going through this, you could have a meeting with a mental health provider to kind of help provide some framework for the client. Um, and also another important piece is when you're preparing for uh, testimony or for situations where the person is likely to be triggered by um, either having to face their, um, their abuser or other situations, like just a stressful situation, like testifying, even if you're not facing your abuser is fundamentally Put an adversarial experience and highly stressful. And so even if the abuser isn't there, just being asked questions by, you know, an attorney or, you know, doing a deposition where there's an, a, a kind of adversarial experience, or even if you're, the person is just being reminded of their trauma and then their symptoms get activated, um, sort of being able to help to um, manage that for the person and okay how are you going to handle this if you do start getting activated how are you going to know that you are getting you know is you, when you become more combative or irritable how are you you know we what are we going to do to handle that and so there may be ways that you could proactively be thinking about that before going you know being in the situation or you know, I, presuming that you have multiple opportunities to maybe observe this type of behavior, um, helping to link it to a f that there, there are physical um, components to what the person has been through. Um, as a clinician, what I have found is that it's very validating. And so again, on that balance of, you don't wanna make the person feel like they're, they're permanently damaged, and on the other hand, recognizing that there are impacts and that it, they're not crazy, that this is something that people who've, been ex, who've experienced domestic violence 
will go through. And so what can we do to help you manage this um, is very validating. And also it's very organizing. So, you know, going back again to that, the PTSD symptoms, like just going through that with clients can, uh, and tying it to some of their physical responses or, you know, the experiences um, can really help to create a little bit of more of a sense of organization for the person that they're, it's not all these disparate things that are happening to them that they are, um, they are experiencing things that, um, that are common and that, uh, you know, they're not, and so basically the messaging around, you know, you're not crazy, but we do have to help you manage when you get activated like this because your um, hyper arousal system is going, you know, going online. We need to figure out how you can calm yourself down. And so I, I am going to do the breathing exercise with you guys soon. Um, and that is one way that you can simply help the person like they can be learning. And a lot of the PTSD treatments that we do, um, I mean, obviously breathing isn't the only thing, but um, there's not, it's not, uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that like yoga and mindfulness and, you know, trauma uh, work, you know, really focuses on, you know, kind of just dysregulate, you know, bringing down the, um, that, that um, automatic arousal system. Okay, so I'm going to move on and, uh, and um, talk in this section about some of the impacts of um, a, a more physical impacts um, that are important to, you know, consider in working with um, specifically domestic violence. And so as you, I'm sure are aware, non-fatal uh, strangulation is um, more the norm than the exception in d domestic violence cases and certainly in the severe kinds of cases that then present themselves for legal um, impacts. And so, you know, you can learn more about this from the Training Institute on Strangulation uh, Prevention, but, um, you know, we know that, uh, you know, our clients um, have, may have experienced that. Well, what is the impact? What does strangulation do? Obviously it impacts our ability to breathe and can lead to um, deprivation, you know, uh, brain deprivation. And um, that in its most severe form can lead to traumatic brain injury. And traumatic brain injury is something that we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about working with domestic violence because um, some of the um, physiologic impacts that may or may not be, you know, you know they may be short term. Um, so like somebody who has a concussion, you know, can recover from that, but they also may impact a, a client's ability to fully be cognitively, um, you know, functioning and also may impact things like memory um, that will, you know, are important for being able to function and pay, you know, and, and um, maybe even like when you're working with, uh, you know, a client around a case. And so, you know, what is traumatic brain injury? It's anything that um, disrupts the normal functioning of the brain that is caused by um, any kind of um, injury to the head. So obviously bumps, blows, and um, so any kind of penetrating head injury. Um, you know, we know about TBIs from the military, um, and that's been a really significant um, source of, you know, post-trauma um, impact in terms of, you know, physical impact. So it could be brief where the person just loses consciousness and, and may, or maybe has a mild concussion where they may have a headache and things like that, need to be in a darkened room for a period of time, or um, could be severe. And so what happens physically is that nerve cells, um, uh, you know, can be damaged and then impacting their ability to kind of, you know, convey signals across the brain. 
And so what we know from TBI is that people who have brain injuries may have difficulty um, you know, thinking clearly and um, you know, moderate to severe can affect us in physical, cognitive and emotional domain. So, you know, if you look at some of these things, I'm not going to go through everything on these lists, but certainly from cognitive, the per, you know, not being able to concentrate, have trouble decision making, uh, memory lapses, um, anxiety, depression. I mean, these are all overlapping with all of the stuff that I've already talked to you about in terms of post-traumatic stress symptoms. So it, but it may be important to also recognize that you're dealing with um, a traumatic brain um, injury component to uh, the clinical presentation of your client. And, um, you know, this, you, you have this in your packet, but this is sort of shows you the regions of the brain and what happens depending on which region um, is impacted and what these regions, you know, it's color coded to um, the regions of the brain and what they normally do. Um, but again, here, what we see with traumatic brain injury for the frontal region, which is our thinking region, that, you know, we also know that people who've had chronic trauma and PTSD may have some executive function difficulties is that we also in traumatic brain injury may see um, irritability, uh, language difficulties, and um, a lack of focus. And uh, some of these other, you know, physical things like a blind spot or blurred vision or slurred speech. And again, <laughs> you know, when we we're going to talk a little bit about substance use. And so, the, you know, these might be complicated diagnostic issues and so if you have a client where you're seeing any of these you know where they've suffered severe um domestic violence and you think there may have been a head injury involved you may need to um you know there's no way that you're or even you know sending the person to a mental health provider in and of itself is going to be able to disentangle um you know, what is going on with the person. But if you think that there could be a complicated picture of post-traumatic stress and or traumatic brain injury, it would be important to um, get further help and screening. So, um, and, and I'm gonna show you actually, I think my slide is a little bit out of order, um, but um, I'm gonna, you know, start with this, like, how do I know if my client has a traumatic brain injury? What might I do about this? Um, uh, I'm going to just leave it to this and show you that, um, you know, what we're talking about is, uh, you know, a neuropsychological assessment might be the most appropriate thing that you would want to bring into an evaluation process. And I'm just showing you that there are a bunch of different cognitive tests that can be done to really help you get a more nuanced picture of both diagnostically what's going on, but then also neurofunctionally what's going on with your client. Um, and particularly, you know, you can, you know, learn if there's, you know, you know, problems with, you know, planning and attention or cognitive reasoning. And those things might be really important for you, not only in terms of thinking about, you know, damages or what are the consequences of the violence and being able to kind of objectify it more. Um, I've certainly participated in doing, um, you know, assessments that have been used um, in cases where you're trying to um, figure out how do you quantify the damages um, to a traumatic exposure. Um, so I'm going to go back to this um, and ask for Shani to jump in because we wanted to just um, present a case that would illustrate some of these dimensions and see you know, if people have, um, would like to interact with us around it or have, want to share their, um, any related uh, material. 
Thank you. So um, I'm bringing a case of change some details, but, but it is a real case um, that took place where we were working with a survivor of domestic violence, uh, Mia, who had suffered child abuse at the hands of one of her parents as a child and was currently coming to us because she was suffering um, domestic violence at the hands of her spouse, Thomas. She was requesting an order of protection from court um, against Thomas who had beaten, strangled, and raped her on various occasions and who had also been directly abusive to their child, Valerie. She had filed police reports in the past about violence um, and ACS actually, the Administrative for Children, Administration for Children's Services who here in New York City investigates allegations of child abuse and neglect um, had gotten involved, but the criminal case was dropped uh, the district attorney said that they had trouble contacting her and therefore they had dropped the case because they viewed that as her not wanting to proceed. I mean, ACS didn't find, they didn't make any findings um, that the child abuse that had been reported to them actually happened. Um, Valerie, the child, was refusing to see the father, um, very adamantly so, and was exhibiting very severe symptoms of PTSD. Mia was also submitting, um, having those symptoms. She was having trouble with memory. She was slurring often when she was speaking with us. And when in court, um, you know, a lot of court officers that were involved with the case would be kind of like rolling their eyes and confused about what was happening because she would often freeze in place or fall to the ground whenever Thomas went into the same courtroom as her. Um, the father was in the courthouse saying that, you know, Mia's alienating the child from him. Um, this comes up a lot in custody visitation cases where there's domestic violence, um, that Mia was lying about all of the abuse as all of the prior reports show that she's mentally unwell or using substances, um, which he says would be shown by, by her erratic behavior. Um, and so I bring this case example to you because, you know, while every single case is very different, um, I think there are parts of this case that might might resonate with others of you here who are practitioners. And I welcome, welcome people's feedback um, about this case or about questions that you may have. Um, but I'll kind of dive into, so what did we do? Um, we've gotten a couple of questions in the chat and some we're gonna get to later on um, a little bit more about, well, then how do you make the courts understand this? How do you make the courts understand how the ramifications of putting a child who is exhibiting PTSD too back in situations where there's visitation. Um, how do you build trust with a client? How do you convince the court when, when prior reports were recanted or when the victim is presenting as aggressive, which is something our courts don't like to see, how do you push back against that? Um, so I welcome comments in the chat because this is a bit of a brain trust here. We've got over 200 people who do this work. So I really welcome everybody's insight but I will um, briefly touch on some of the things we did at the outset. Um, so the first thing that we did is that we didn't, we didn't label. When she was coming um, to our appointments or in court slurring, I'll admit that there were flags raised for me and I was curious if she was um, you know, misusing substances or what was happening. But instead of asking her like, are you drunk? What's wrong? I, I set space where I specifically left time and the intention to figure out what it was that was going on and then once I was able to do that, I realized that she had had a lot of head injuries. And so something that I did that I thought was also gonna be relevant for the case in general, but would also help me develop an understanding with the client is, you know, I worked with her, we were getting medical reports because she had had to go to the hospital before for injuries. When I saw those flags in the medical reports too, I think that provided a lot of corroboration um, that we could use to be able to um, show you know, other people to the extent it was, you know, in our interest and we had her authorization to show, um, but to provide these certified records. We also knew immediately that we had to connect both her and her child with supportive resources. Um, one of the big takeaways we hope that you all have from this entire training series is that the partnership between lawyers and mental health providers is essential when working with trauma survivors. Um, there's limitations to what I can do, no matter how much I acknowledge or understand. I need somebody who's an expert to be able to work with the client, to engage with the client, and to provide constant support. Um, those um, mental health providers were able to provide that support for her, um, to work with her day of, um, day before, and day after, whenever we had courts, to provide grounding, um, to be on call if, if an issue or a crisis arose. Um, but also when working with the child, um, what we got was this outside expert that was able to inform the court, um, you know, these are PTSD symptoms that we're seeing from the child. These are things that we think would worsen 
the PTSD symptoms, such as forcing them to engage with somebody right now when they're currently attempting to address this here in therapy, continuing to put that in environment would A, make them feel unsafe, could perhaps regress the symptoms even, even further, and also creates an honest danger. And I think that folding in these expertise creates this opportunity to not only identify what's going on, which as lawyers, like the goal is not that we can see a client and say, you too have PTSD, please let's not do that. But to realize that there are these flags that are going on that without labeling clients, without viewing, you're being aggressive for no reason, you're slurring, why is this happening? Um, you're unable to remember things, is that a problem? Getting a flag that maybe we need to take time to sit down and instead of doing our direct question and answer with clients, give space for them to kind of come at us with narratives, ask questions around things and start to link with resources that can not only provide the client with additional support, which is essential, provide us with additional information about how do we interpret these behaviors, how do we interpret these medical records, and if appropriate and necessary, provide that same information to the court um, through the lens of an expert um, versus just our client's own voice, which very powerful in and of itself. But I do think that expert corroboration can be really essential as well as really helpful to get out that story, to get out the understanding of why somebody's presenting this way and that it's connected to the trauma and not connected to them not being able to be a parent or not being able to recall or tell the truth. Um, and so some things that we've gotten in the chat, and I do welcome other questions as they come in, we're, you know, we'll get to more of this as well. So please keep coming in, even if we go forward. But something that somebody mentioned is that we, what's really important is that we do a great deal of recognition when clients come with us to us. Absolutely. Well, thank you, um, Shani. And we'll, we can come back to some of the elements of this case also um, with the next uh, set of slides that I'm going to show you. Um, but what I want to do now is for the purposes of ourselves, you know, ourselves, but also because, and I'm going to send you, I don't, I didn't um, get a chance to send this, but I'm going to send you a sheet of breathing exercises. Um, we're going to do one right now. I'm just going to walk us through it. Um, um, but what we know is that because of that um, you know, activated uh, emotional dysregulation and activated sympathetic nervous system that for trauma, you know, like I said before, a lot, if not all of our trauma interventions incorporate breathing exercises into um, many of the sessions. And so, um, you know, we, we do uh, so I'm just going to do uh, uh, one technique, and um, but it, it, we use that to help our patients kind of recenter and reset. So for the moment, I'm going to um, do what's known as four, seven, eight breathing. So first, um, you know, find a comfortable position that you're sitting in, and um, be sure to practice good posture uh, when you're starting out. Um, uh, I want you to prepare for the practice of this by resting the tip of your tongue against the roof of your mouth, right behind your top front teeth. You'll need to keep your tongue in place throughout the practice. Um, it may take practice to keep from moving your tongue when you exhale. But exhaling during four, seven, eight breathing can be easier for some people when they purse their lips. Um, so the following cycle I'd like you to do, um, you know, in the cycle of one breath. First, let your lips part. Make a whooshing sound, exhaling completely through your mouth. Next, close your lips. Inhaling silently through your nose as you count to four. One, two, three, four. Then for seven seconds, hold your breath. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Make another whooshing exhale from your mouth for eight seconds. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. When you inhale again, you'll initiate, initiate a new cycle of breath. And we're gonna do this one more time, but typically you would do it four full times. So let your lips part. Exhale completely through your mouth. Now inhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, whooshing out, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, this says, uh, shouldn't be practiced in a setting where you're not to prepared to be fully relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, um, in this case, uh, you know, we're gonna be continuing with the material, but um, I did want to just take a little reset and um, also encourage you to uh, consider doing that with your clients and teaching your clients that and um, similarly you know you know when when preparing them for testimony and things like that this can be a skill and this is something that it's a practice it's not something that you can automatically do but um, and it may seem kind of corny but it is something that we can all do and um, really can help um, clients have something to hold on to. Um, Shani also mentioned grounding, which is another tool that, um, you know, that I highly recommend. Um, and so moving on, um, and we've talked about this, and this was also in the case, um, but it's very important for us to recognize that as a part of um, you know, what I was talking about in terms of memory and impacts that um, both from a psychological perspective and from a physiological perspective, um, when we work with people with trauma, we are dealing with the problem of the trauma memory. And, um, you know, there are different components of the memory process that, you know, are, are listed here. Um, but it could have to do with being able to remember something that happened and it also can impact the way we retrieve our memories so that the memory might be there, but there may be inconsistencies about when and how we remember, um, in, in, you know, when we've been exposed to trauma. And so, um, you know, this can be very uh, challenging when you are in the business of needing the person to be able to narrate their experience and where in a legal context there's this sort of like wanting people to be able to detail exactly what happened in a systematic way and tell the same narrative every time and you know Typically, people who've experienced trauma may not have access to their memories all the time. And so dissociation is a component of a trauma reaction. And so what is dissociation? Um, and then we'll have a moment um, to talk about uh, challenges related to this from a legal standpoint. But dissociation is part of that again going back to that fight flight and freeze dissociation is freeze and so dissociation is also a normative part of how we as humans put distance between bad things that have happened to us in order so that we can you know function in our daily lives and are not actively reliving uh, the trauma. And so dissociation is a part of a trauma response, 
but it is it it is a lack of continuity so so depending on when a trauma occurs a person may have no memory of what happened to them and that could also be impacted by you know brain related um, issues of lack of it, it just hasn't been encoded in their memory system but there there can be a continuum of access to memory um, and so you know that's another feature of a challenge that you all have in working with clients um, and so i don't know if people want to um you know pop in and uh say anything about that but like we listed out here and shani i don't know if you want to say anything about this but like we thought it was important for um you know to be mentioned and talked about the fact that people may have questions about what is the credibility of the reporting um, and how much can we you know feel that the person is telling the truth it, or if they don't have a memory for all of the details of what happened to them or there are some inconsistencies in their narrative like how do we work with that and can does that mean we should say oh they don't know what happened they're they're lying or they don't really they're we can't take their um report of what happened um as as credible so it's you know like many of the other things we're talking about it's complicated um and i i know that you guys know that um but any comments or thoughts or questions about this move on just going to give folks a, a couple of seconds in case they're typing if anybody has any specific questions that you would want us to dive a bit deeper into before we move on. Um, and if not, just a reminder that we're gonna be saving all of the questions that do come through in the chat throughout this, as well as in the feedback we take after each session. We're gonna be folding those very specific case questions into our last part of the training series, training eight, so we can dive deeper into case examples and how to navigate and strategize with very specific cases we all have. So. So I don't see anything in the chat for now, but please keep it coming. And as a reminder, we'll, we'll add this into training eight if we don't even get to it today. Okay, so I'm gonna pivot a little bit to talk about substance use, which is another consequence of um, trauma exposure and, and uh, that is important for us to cover um, again for in terms of understanding um, and sort of, uh, destigmatizing uh for our clients and also you know because it cre it may create some complexities in terms of how do we work with our clients and understand you know um what they're going through and how to manage and or how to manage uh you know care if uh substance use which is a very common um outcome of of trauma exposure um, for many of the clients that and so this has you know been a big part of what i do in my clinical and research life is working with the comorbidity and overlap of trauma ptsd and substance use but um you guys probably do all know about the aces study and adverse child events um uh but i'm just mentioning that one of the big impacts of the ACEs study, which was from the, C, the Center for D, uh, Disease Control, um, a study of mortality, uh, uh, factors associated with morbidity and mortality. Um, you know, they asked a measure of, you know, childhood adversity exposure and found that there was a graded and progressive relationship to the more um, adversity events uh, the person endorsed before the age of 18, the higher the likelihood that they would also have a substance use um, disorder in their, you know, in, in their history. And so I show you that, I show you that this is a mini assessment tool that again, if you haven't, um, you know, used it, it's a 10 item tool. It's sort of the collective of the very best trauma assessments sort of all squeezed into one um, easy tool where you can give it to the person and they can answer a yes if they've had 
any kind of physical abuse in childhood or um, you know, emotional abuse, and they you know, get a, a score of one to 10. Um, and that can be very useful in um, you know, identifying you know, childhood abuse events. What we know, you know from childhood, and this is, you know, again, no surprise that um, the incidents between childhood abuse and then sexual assault in emerging adulthood and its um, overlap with substance use is, is very high. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of like, you know, you know uh, very negative impacts, uh, you know, we think about, you know, what's been happening in this country in relation to the opioid epidemic, but substance use um, and, and suicide are um, very, you see these kinds of rates, poisonings, um, which are the opioid overdoses, um, suicides, chronic liver disease, these are all deaths of despair that are on the rise and um, uh, we're particularly aware of it in relation to the opioid crisis. Um, what I also want to show is just that in terms of um, you know racial and ethnic disparities that um, our black and brown communities are also disproportionately affected by um, the opioid epidemic. So this is not just a problem of you know young uh, or, or white men and and prescription drug use, but we're also seeing you know extremely high rates of um, overdose now with uh, combined fentanyl and stimulant uh, use as well. So um, so um, you know and trauma is kind of at the base of this, and so we know that having a history of post traumatic stress predisposes us to um, potentially developing substance use problems and that once you have a substance use problem you may be more likely to then be in a domestic partnership that has a violent component to it you may be more likely to be victimized um, in you know or assaulted in a number of ways um, but the bottom line is that we um, do see that there's a connection um, and that uh, we need to be able to, if we're working with people who have trauma, we also need to be able to work with the substance use impacts. And yet, when you're dealing with cases like with Mia, where, um, you know, there's a question about substance use, and then there's also questions about child custody and what to do, that can be very, uh, very complicated um, also relating to you know the whether someone has um you know how reliable of a reporter are they if they're using substances and yet um the use of substances um is really a way of self-treating um many of the symptoms so when we again going back to ptsd when we think about hyper arousal we know that a lot of our patients may drink or use cannabis and that that's a, a very successful way of helping to dampen down that at very hyperactive, um, you know, regulation system. Um, we do, you know, in terms of addiction, and this again is going back to the sort of neuroscience piece of it, um, there are certain regions of our brain that we know are changed by the use of substances. So once a person starts um, using something, it, uh, you know, it activates the reward system, system of our brain and makes us want the substance again, because it makes us feel good. It's part of, uh, you know, the uh, rewarding motivational system that we have. And so not everyone develops a substance use disorder when they use a substance, but for those who start using more and more or using more heavily, then the person you know starts craving the substance and wanting the substance because it makes them feel good and the brain re is responding to that and what we know is that however eventually in addiction um, the regions of the brain 
that, um, that um, then start experiencing a withdrawal when the person has become physically um, either drawn to the substance or they become physically dependent on the substance, then when they don't have it, obviously they start needing it and the emotion system goes along with that. And so this provides us with another explanation of how trauma and addiction co-occur and that there are shared parts of the brain that um, are you know intersect and and create um, you know a, the likelihood that there it's not just a it's not just a random association between having a trauma history and then maybe being developing a substance use problem, but that there are um, biological underpinnings that those stress um, reactions actually um, drive people um, and drive addictive behavior. And so uh, why is this important for us to know? Not because we're trying to, again, pathologize our clients, but we do want to understand that if they're using substances, we want, that, you know, I, I would hope that there could be a destigmatizing uh, component to that, to be able to understand that we, we're not dealing with someone who's weak. We're not dealing with someone who is an addict, but we're dealing with someone who has trauma and that the trauma stress component of their, the way that they've been impacted will increase, may increase the likelihood that they would use substances. And also if they don't have access to mental health care, it may be that drinking or using cannabis or using some other substance is the best way that the person has for managing their PTSD symptoms. So um, the other two or, or, or one of the areas that we haven't talked about yet that I wanted to mention for you is the, con so these are different domains that are impacted, um, neurofunctional domains that are impacted by um, trauma and addiction. And we've talked about, um, you know, kind of the, you know, memory, cognition, planning, organization. Um, um, but we haven't talked about the social area. And what we know is that in, in terms of social cognition, or otherwise known as kind of our ability to trust in interpersonal domains, that's not only a you know, a psychological dimension of why some of our clients have difficulty with trust, but we also, there's a whole science behind how we perceive um, and make decisions about trust in our, you know, in our perception and in, in our um, regions of our brain that help us decide whether a relationship is a good relationship or not a good relationship. And those can be um, altered. And so we do know that trust is another dimension that's very important for us to be thinking about um, with our clients. And um, this is what I was alluding to before with regard to um, the issue of um, people presenting with, you know, they could meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. They could have substance use problems. They could have uh, depression and uh, there's um, there's a, a um, concept of complex trauma, which actually in the European diagnostic system, the ICD-10, complex trauma or CPTSD will be a diagnosis in that diagnosis, in DSM, I think it was proposed in ICD-10 and it will be in ICD-11. I don't know if that's something that any of you um, kind of deal with. It's not in the DSM yet. We don't have a D DSM-5 um, is relatively recent and we're not getting close to DSM-6, but for, from the point of view of many of the cases that you're dealing with, um, I think a diagnostic profile that kind of encompasses so many of the different components that we've been talking about um, is the complex trauma or CPTSD um, diagnosis. And, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, some of the comments that we heard earlier and also the Mia case, um, uh, 
these are some of the dimensions that uh, you know you can see through a complex trauma lens. Um, you know, when you have a, a client that has these kinds of issues, and oftentimes they might be viewed as a very difficult client because there are you know a lot of moving parts and um, doesn't make your life easier as you know when you're trying to prepare somebody for as a witness or whether you're trying to determine um, impacts on child custody. Um, but I just wanted to take a pause here and see if if anybody wants to um, make a comment or ask a question. If not, I'll carry on. Nothing. I'm going to give some space for a question. We did get some um, in the meantime that was talking about um, the credibility impact that you kind of referenced a bit earlier, right? How, how do you, when, when you're talking about all these things in terms of how somebody is truly impacted, which goes into how they express things, how they can recall things, um, how they may present and if they can at all, how do we address credibility overall? Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts. I'm glad to, to also say some, some things. Um, I can start, but I guess uh, one thing I guess that I would say is just as a, from taking a step back, so much of what we can do for clients is limited, right? But the reality is, is that our system is what our system is, and it is not designed uh, in a trauma-informed way. Um, it, cause a lot of, it causes a lot of harm, um, and we, we all know that as we're navigating through it. Um, and so one of the main things is, is that a lot of this is about developing an attorney-client relationship, a legal, an advocate-client relationship, and, and how to do that. And so I think just also acknowledging for yourself, right? Like something that I always say is, is that I actually find it to be a little bit more surprising if I can ask somebody to tell me about their trauma history and they can go from day one chronologically in specific order, the way our courts ask for it, um, through day 30, the end day of it, and give me every single incident and go back and say it consistently four different times, that to me would be a bit more unexpected than somebody that does have some gaps, that does conflate some issues, and that does circle back to do that. And so first, I think that acknowledgement, that trust, especially for somebody that might not have been trusted before, right? When we were talking about Mia's case, her experience with the criminal justice system in ACS was disbelief. And so if we use that as a barrier automatically versus coming at them with belief from the outset and understanding and opening that up, I think that, you know, that, that does help in a lot of ways. Um, I also think that something that we think about is this is the point of mental health experts getting involved with our cases, right? Not only to provide support to the client, which can help them perhaps, um, you know, through different exercises, either be able to be more confident in the things they can recall and confident in the things they can't and themselves explain why. In immigration, for example, we often do this in our immigration cases. We explain that there are memory issues and then we provide reasons for why there may be some memory issues or inconsistencies. Um, but also using mental health experts to educate the court um, or the administrative body that you're before because the reality is, is we're, they're people too, they're humans too. Um, and as much as we hope that they're attending these types of trainings, there, there are experts that have been doing this for a lifetime that can create a record um, which can also be really helpful. Um, and you can use strategies perhaps about do the experts present before your client? So before your client even gets up there, there's an understanding about how the story might be told and why. Um, and I think something that is coming through in the chat that, that I'll, I'll put back to you, Denise, is um, something that when, when working with clients is, is that the, in, the tone in which they describe things can sometimes be perhaps alarming. That might be related to disassociation or some other things, but sometimes they might sound indifferent. Other times they might sound more aggressive, which, which somebody that's listening to it might hear in the lens of a perpetrator versus a victim. I don't know if you have some reaction to that. Um, my reaction is that I, we would more expect that 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 would be the norm than the exception. And so some of it could be in helping to, um, you know, do that pre-testimony kind of preparation. But I do think, and I wanted to underscore, and I have served as a, a, as a, a witness, as a, you know, a mental health expert, a trauma witness 
for um, expert witness, but um, for these for a case where I had to describe what is complex trauma and how does it relate to the 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 the, the defendant or you know actually what what I'm not going to go into the details of that case, but that it's very important to I think provide that lens through which to understand how the person and if you think your person is going to dissociate or you think the client is going to have some of those reactions that those are put into you know are, are put into the case with um, with the help of uh, a mental health expert who can or a trauma expert really who can help to um, create that because you know there are many clients where it doesn't matter what you do you're going to see that happening especially under a condition of um, stress and so that numbing, either numbing or the opposite, like aggressiveness, um, and which are both not helpful, you know, if somebody doesn't really understand where that's coming from. Okay, I'm going to continue because we do want to stop for, um, although I think we have sort of built in some discussion along the way, but I do want to leave time for any other, any questions. Um, what I'm going to talk about next is just a very sort of quick, um, you know, review that of some of the treatments, not because this is at all a, a, a talk on treatment, but just that there are uh, a number of evidence-based um, modalities that are both behavioral, meaning psychotherapy or psychoeducation, and also um, you know, medication interventions that can be helpful in um, working with clients. And that um, one of the things that we wanted to kind of um, convey to the group is that there should not be any kind of one size fits all idea about what is treatment um, or what are the best treatments, because there's a lot of different ways that we can intervene with our clients. Um, and there are different phases of um, treatment that uh, treatment types that very broadly that either focus more on coping skills and managing emotion and then other treatments that focus on really delving more into trauma material and um, you know and focusing on um, you know, uh, either exposure-based models or what they're known as trauma processing models. And what I wanted to <laughs> convey is that there are over 50 clinical trials that have been done for people with PTSD and substance use showing the efficacy of a whole host of different behavioral models. So, um, you know, I think access to mental health care and services is really important. Um, ideally, if you can have a client be getting one of the, you know, some of the evidence-based treatments, that would be, you know, kind of the best um, uh, approach. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it, get, getting people help when they need it is obviously really important. And then there are also many medications that have been used to target both trauma and also substance use. Um, some of them focus only on the trauma piece, like um, SSRIs, like the antidepressant medications that have been shown to be effective. And some um, can be, you know, for people that have opioid use problems, obviously medication assisted therapy is crucial. Um, what we know is that the psychotherapy, so the behavioral interventions tend to be most effective and are sort of treatments of choice in this population. Although, um, you know, adding medication is also, um, you know, has been shown to be very important, although we don't have enough um, evidence to say which medications are the best medications. So there's no practice best guidelines other than to say that there's no reason not to give uh, medication to you know people who have substance use and also have um, you know uh, traumatic stress um, before we stopped I did want to mention that um, 
there is no, you know, even though cannabis has been seen, you know, patients will talk about how um, they use cannabis, particularly for sleeping, because sleeping can be such an issue for people who have um, trauma, again, that arousal that we talked about. Um, so a lot of our clients talk about using cannabis um, for sleep. There's actually no evidence that cannabis is a treatment for PTSD, even though it's on many of the lists. So it, it is something to kind of like consider carefully in, in relation to uh, clients, but a lot of our clients do, you know, um, you know seek legal marijuana. Um, but I did think that that was important for you to know. And um, I have just put a list, and I'm sure that you guys also have other lists that you're giving out to people, but I, do, I did put a list of some of the programs that we would recommend um, around the New York metropolitan area um, that um, address trauma and addiction. One resource that is just um, really great, if you haven't gone to the National Center for PTSD, um, website it's you know publicly available um uh stuff but there's a lot of treatment toolboxes and um materials web-based ptsd coach to help with you know so I, I highly recommend um the national center and um if you need to find me you have these uh pdf of these slides um but uh just wanted to thank you all for um, your attention and time and hope that um, you know you can use some of what we've talked about today and should uh, I don't know if you want people to do this after or if we should stop for Q&A we have some you know about 10 minutes um, I do have some questions um, I don't know maybe I can I can ask perhaps one now and um, somebody can come in to explain how to use this barcode again. Okay. Um, but one of the questions we got was about your last section and I think it, it, it kind of crosses all, all of our practice areas, which is that sometimes when we're working with clients and survivors, they are reticent to engage in mental health services or take medicine um, that has been prescribed to them by their mental health care provider because of the negative impact that it could be used against them. It could be used against them in a custody case. It could be used against them in terms of their stability, memory recall, all the things we spoke about um, in criminal cases. And that's, that's a big challenge for a lot of, a lot of clients and people. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know, that, you know, and not as an attorney, I don't know if you have a thought about that as an attorney, I mean, you know, if they have diabetes, um, should they not take insulin if they need, like, how is that any, di you know, I understand the question, but that would be part of my answer to that. I think that's a great answer, actually. Um, I think that we, you know, it's a, it, everything we do is our client's choice, right? When we're working with survivors, it's imperative. We're allying with them. We're presenting options. That's our goal. Um, and we're responding to questions they have. And we certainly don't want to like predicate, you know, we're not going to work with you if you don't get on this medicine. We don't want to tell people you should take this medicine. I'm not a doctor. I don't know what the interactions with the individual and medicine might be in their history. But I think that recognition of like, this is important. And if this is important to you, then let's talk about that. Let's talk about how it could impact your case. Let's talk about how we can you know, respond to some of the impacts that it might have on your case preemptively or affirmatively to minimize that as being your, your bigger risk. We can also talk about, is this the moment you want to go forward? I think this is such an essential thing that when we meet with clients, sometimes they're forced into the system and there's not much we can do, but other times they're, they're, they're making a choice to, to go forward. And I don't want to ever take that away from somebody, but, but the option that services can be completely available to somebody, not a, even if you're not ready at this exact moment, we can work with you now, get supportive structures in place, help you feel stable, help you get into a place of safety and the option to engage with the system later, perhaps when some of that has been um, resolved and they're ready is, is still open for somebody. Because the reality is, is that um, sometimes our system can't respond in the immediate moment in the way that we know our clients needs and our client deserves. 
Um, and we, we want to be the place that continues to say th there's an open door. The system may be hard. The system may be challenging. There may be too much now. Let's talk about all the options and let's talk about if that includes the option of when. When do you want to do each thing? Um, I'm sure that there's some other people that might have some insight too. So, so I welcome other thoughts if people have them. Um, while we wait for that and any other questions, I don't know if um, Integra or Uju, does anybody want to talk about the post-session evaluation and the barcode? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, Denise. It was so uh, packed with a lot of information and very useful tools and tips. Uh, so after each session, we, uh, we want to make sure we're providing the best type of uh, training for you. So we'd like to conduct these evaluations. This QR code, which you see on your screen, is one of the easy ways you could just do it on your phone. So all you need to do, there are instructions on the right-hand side of that, of the, uh, the, of the PowerPoint, but hold your smartphone up to the screen until the, the view is captured by the, the QR code is fits the, the view screen, and it should automatically pop up on your phone. Um, you may need to click a button, but it should automatically pop up, and then you can start filling out the evaluation right on your phone. We'll also be sending out the, the link later in another email. Um, last year. I don't, I don't see any other questions for now. So I think, I think we can end here, but please everybody do use those evaluation forms as a way to give us feedback and what you hope to be covered in future sessions. As a reminder in training eight, we'll be diving deeper into some of the practical case examples. And thank you, thank you so much, Denise, for this amazing presentation. And in general, um, OVS and Uju for bringing us all together to have this training series overall. This is, um, really an amazing opportunity for so many of us to, to join together across the country. And as mentioned before, we'll also be following up with some um, larger scale um, resources um, that will all be in the Google Drive um, so that we can all continue to learn from each other. And we hope you join us for our next training session, um, which is next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for all your help. It has been great. Yes, it has. I enjoyed it. By the way, Dr. Hine, the breathing exercise was wonderful. Thanks. I just want to say that was a um, very quick two hours. So that's oh, also a wow. great, great sign. It was thank great. You. See you all next week. Hey, thank you. Please all put right, the guys. feedback in the, in the evaluation. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. I'll, I'll say cheerio. Bye.